The Assassin's Blade is a collection of novellas written by Sarah J. Maas as part of the Throne of Glass series. This story is The Assassin and the Desert. There was nothing left in the world except sand and wind. At least that's how it seemed to Selenia Sardothin as she stood atop the crimson dunes and gazed across the desert. Even with the wind, the heat was stifling, and sweat made many layers of her clothes cling to her body. But sweating, her nomad guide had told her, was a good thing. It was when you didn't sweat that the Red Desert became deadly. Sweating reminded you to drink, when the heat evaporated your perspiration before you could realize you were sweating, that's when you could cross into dehydration and not know it. Oh, the miserable heat! It invaded every pore of her, made her head throb and her bones ache. The muddy warmth of Skull's Bay had been nothing compared to this. What she wouldn't give for just the briefest of cool breezes. Beside her, the nomad guide pointed a gloved finger towards the southwest. The Sesiz Zukasta there. Sesiz Zukast, the silent assassins. The legendary order that she had been sent here to train with. This is for you to learn obedience and, and discipline. discipline. Arobe and Hamel had said. In the height of summer in the Red Desert was what he failed to add. It was a punishment. Two months ago, when Arobin had sent Selenia along with Sam Cortland to Skull's Bay on an unknown errand, they'd discovered that he'd actually dispatched them to trade in slaves. Needless to say, that hadn't sat well with Selenia or Sam, despite their occupation. So they'd freed the slaves, deciding to damn the consequences. But now, as punishments went, this was probably the worst, given the bruises and the cuts that were still healing on her face a month after Arobin had bestowed them. That was saying something. Selenia scowled. She pulled the scarf a bit higher over her mouth and nose, as she took a step down the dune. Her legs strained against the sliding sand, but it was a welcome freedom after the harrowing trek through the singing sands, where each grain had hummed and whined and moaned. They'd spent a whole day monitoring each step, careful to keep the sand beneath them ringing in harmony. Or else, the nomad had told her, the sand could dissolve into quicksand. Selenia descended the dune, but paused when she didn't hear her guide's footsteps. Aren't you coming? The man remained atop the dune and pointed again to the horizon. Two miles, that way. His use of the common tongue was a bit unwieldy, but she understood him well enough. She pulled down the scarf from her mouth, wincing as a gust of sand stung her sweaty face. I paid you to take me there. Two miles, he said, adjusting the large pack on his back. The scarf around his head obscured his tanned features, but she could still see the fear in his eyes. Yes, yes, the Sissis Zukast were feared and respected in the desert. It had been a miracle that she'd found a guide willing to take her this close to the fortress. Of course, offering gold had helped, but the nomads viewed the Sassiz Sukast as little less than shadows of death. And apparently, her guide would go no further. She studied the westward horizon. She could see nothing beyond dunes and sand that rippled like the surface of a wind-blown sea. To Mars, the nomad said behind her. They will find you. 
Selenia turned to ask him another question, but he had already disappeared over the other side of the dune. Cursing him, Mother. she tried to swallow, but failed. Her mouth was too dry. She had to start now, or else she'd need to set up her tent to sleep out the unforgiving midday and afternoon heat. Two miles. How long could that take? Taking a sip from her unnervingly light water skin, Selenia pulled her scarf back over her mouth and nose and began walking. The only sound was the wind hissing through the sand. Hours later, Selenia found herself using all of her self-restraint to avoid leaping into the courtyard pools or kneeling to drink at one of the little rivers running along the floor. No one had offered her water upon her arrival, and she didn't think her current escort was inclined to do so either, as he led her through the winding halls of the Red Sandstone Fortress. Two miles had felt more like twenty. She had been just about to stop and set up her tent when she crested a dune and the lush green trees and adobe fortress had spread before her, hidden in an oasis nestled between two mountainous sand dunes. After all that, she was parched. But she was Selenia Saradothin. She had a reputation to uphold. She kept her senses alert as they walked farther into the fortress, taking in exits and windows, noting where sentries were stationed. They passed a row of open-air training rooms in which she could see people from all kingdoms and of all ages, sparring or exercising, or just sitting quietly, lost in meditation. They climbed a narrow flight of stairs that went up and up into a large building, the shade of the stairwell was wonderfully cool. But then they entered a long, enclosed hallway, and the heat wrapped around her like a blanket. For a fortress of supposedly silent assassins, the place was fairly noisy, with the clatter of weapons from the training rooms, the buzzing of insects in the many trees and bushes, the chatter of birds, the gargle of all the crystal clear water running through every room and hall. They approached an open set of doors at the end of the hallway. Her escort, a middle-aged man flecked with scars that stood out like chalk marks against his tanned skin, said nothing to her. Beyond the doors, the interior was a mixture of shadow and light. They entered a giant chamber flanked by blue-painted wooden pillars that supported a mezzanine on either side. A glance into the darkness of the balcony informed her that there were figures lurking there, watching, waiting. There were more in the shadows of the columns. Whoever they thought she was, they certainly weren't underestimating her. Good. A narrow mosaic of green and blue glass tiles wove through the floor towards the dais, echoing the little rivers on the lower levels. Atop the dais, seated among cushions and potted palms, was a white-robed man. The Mute Master. She had expected him to be ancient, but he seemed to be around 50. She kept her chin held high as they approached him, following the tile path in the floor. She couldn't tell if the master skin had always been that tanned, or if it was from the sun. He smiled slightly. He'd probably been handsome in his youth. Sweat oozed down Selenia's spine. Though the master had no visible weapons, the two servants fanning him with palm leaves were armed to the teeth. Her escort stopped a safe distance from the master and bowed. Selenia did the same, and when she raised herself, she removed the hood from over her hair. She was sure it was a mess and disgustingly greasy after two weeks in the desert with no water to bathe in. 
but she wasn't here to impress him with her beauty. The mute master looked her up and down, and then nodded. Her escort nudged her with an elbow, and Selenia cleared her dry throat as she stepped forward. She knew the mute master wouldn't say anything. His self-imposed silence was well known. It was incumbent upon her to make an introduction. Robin had told her exactly what to say. Ordered her was more like it. There would be no disguises, no masks, no fake names. Since she had shown such disregard for Robin's best interests, he no longer had any inclination to protect hers. She'd debated for weeks on how she might find a way to protect her identity, to keep these strangers from knowing who she was. But Robin's orders had been simple. She had one month to win the Mute Master's respect, and if she didn't return home with his letter of approval, a letter about Selenia Saradothin, she'd better find a new city to live in, possibly a new continent. Thank you for granting me an audience, Master of the Silent Assassins, she said, silently cursing the stiffness of her words. She put a hand over her heart and dropped to both knees. I am Selenia Saradothin, protégé of Arobin Hamel, king of the Northern Assassins. Adding Northern seemed appropriate. She didn't think the Mute Master would be much pleased to learn that Arobin called himself the king of all the Assassins. But whether or not it surprised him, his face revealed nothing though she sensed some of the people in the shadows shifting on their feet. My master has sent me here to beseech you to train me. She said, chafing at the words. Train her? She lowered her head so the mute master wouldn't see the ire on her face. I am yours. She tilted her palms face up in a gesture of supplication. Nothing. Warmth, worse than the heat of the desert, singed her cheeks. She kept her head down, her arms still upheld. Cloth rustled, then nearly silent steps echoed through the chamber. At last, two bare, brown feet stopped before her. A dry finger tilted her chin up and Selenia found herself staring into the sea-green eyes of the master. She didn't dare move. With one movement, the master could snap her neck. This was a test. A test of trust, she realized. She willed herself into stillness, focusing on the details of his face to avoid thinking of how vulnerable she was. Sweat beaded along the border of his dark hair, which was cropped close to his head. It was impossible to tell what kingdom he hailed from. His hazelnut skin suggested Elway, but his elegant, almond-shaped eyes suggested one of the countries in the distant southern continent. Regardless, how had he wound up here? She braced herself as his long fingers pushed back a loose strand of her braided hair, revealing the yellowing bruises that still lingered around her eyes and cheeks, and the narrow arc of scabs along her cheekbone. Had Arobin sent word that she would be coming? Had he told him the circumstances under which she had been packed off? The mute master didn't seem at all surprised by her arrival. But the master's eyes narrowed, his lips forming a tight line as he looked at the remnants of the bruises on the other side of her face. She was lucky that Arobin was skilled enough to keep the blows from permanently marring her. A twinge of guilt went through her as she wondered if Sam had healed as well. In the three days following her beating, she hadn't seen him around the keep. She'd blacked out before Arobin could deal with her companion. And since that night, even during her trip out here, everything had been a haze of rage and sorrow, 
and bone-deep weariness, as if she were dreaming while awake. She calmed her thundering heart just as the master released her face and stepped back. He motioned with a hand for her to rise, which she did, to the relief of her aching knees. The master gave her a crooked smile. She would have echoed the expression, but an instant later, the master snapped his fingers, triggering four men to charge at her. <laughs>